Hi everyone and welcome to the first of the Aristotle um, recordings. There's going to be quite a few of these because the reading is quite long, um, but hopefully uh, they help to clarify things. Um, this first one I'll try and rip through pretty quickly uh, and it's looking at um, the idea of master versus subordinate goods. In other words, what are the things that we do for the sake of something else and what are the things we do for their own sake? Um, Aristotle will then identify the thing uh, the master good for mankind is politics. Um, his idea behind this is that it's actually um, what everything that we do aims at and uh, not in the sort of modern, very jaded idea of politics, but actually the genuine idea of politics is there to make a good society. Um, and then finally, uh, just a little section on Aristotle sort of setting the boundaries of the discussion, um, which is the idea of, well, now that we've determined that um, politics is what we're here to do. Uh, how do we define the correct action to take? Um, well, we have to define this quite imprecisely and imperfectly. Okay. Um, with these recordings uh, for Aristotle, they're broken down by firstly the book. So we're just looking at book one and book two of the Nicomachean Ethics. And then they're also broken down into the chapters, which you can see in your reading. Um, some of the recordings will be quite long. Um, so what I'd recommend you do is listen to sort of one chapter at a time. Um, so book one, part one, for example, um, and that will help to break up particularly some of the longer recordings. So this one should be relatively short. Okay. Um, so pens and highlighters out. Um, so you should be looking at the page, the very first page of the Aristotle reading book one, the human good, the subject of our inquiry. Okay. So here we go. Um, Book one, part one, some goods are master and others subordinate. Okay, so subject of our inquiry, all human activities aim at some good, some goods subordinate to others. Uh, every art and every inquiry and similarly every action and choice is thought to aim at some good. And for this reason, the good has rightly been to declared to be that at which all things aim. So what is the good? Uh, and like, for example, what is the good life? Uh, what is a good society? What is a good person? Well, it is that at which all things aim. Everything that we're doing is actually trying to achieve the good life. It's just sometimes we stray. Um, but a certain difference is found among ends. Some are activities while others are products apart from the activities that produce them. Where there are ends apart from the actions, it is the nature of the products to be better than the activities. So, for example, the activity of building a house and the actual house itself, well, the house is better than the act of building it. Okay. Uh, now, as there are many actions, arts and sciences, their ends are also many, and the end of the medical art is health, that of shipbuilding, a vessel, that of strategy, victory, that of economics, wealth. Um, so this is the difference between the art and what we get at the end of it. Um, but where such arts fall under a single capacity as bridle making and the other arts concerned with the equipment of horses fall under the art of riding and this and every military action under strategy, in the same way other arts fall under yet others. In all of these, the ends of the master arts are to be preferred to all the subordinate ends, for it is the sake of the former that the latter are pursued. Okay, so that's probably the most important like sentence of this reading, um, what we just read, uh, because what Aristotle is saying here is that um, whilst it is you know great to be a master bridle maker and to make a horse's bridle better than anyone else, that really only has value because it allows us to ride horses better. Okay, riding horses better in the capacity that Aristotle's discussing really only has value as it allows our military to perform better. Having a military that performs better actually only has value as it allows us to achieve our strategic goals. Okay, so we can see here that bridle making, whilst, you know, we should aim to be the best bridle makers that we can, we shouldn't think that that is as important as strategic victory. Okay, it is a part of it though, but it is subordinate to strategic victory. You can be the best bridle maker in the world, but if your military is trash, well, your city is going to be overrun anyway. Okay, um, so strategic victory is the master. Uh, bridle making is subordinate to that. Okay, 
Um, it makes no difference whether the activities themselves are ends or the actions or something else apart from the activities, as in the case of the sciences just mentioned. So remember, we achieve the subordinate ends for the sake of the master ends. We want really good bridal makers so that we can win wars. It might sound like it's separated, but it's actually not. Okay, bridal making is subordinate to victory. Okay, so some things are subordinate to the master. We should be prioritizing the master over the subordinate, and the master is more valuable than the subordinate. Okay, uh, book one, part two. Uh, the ma so then, now that we've established this, what is the chief good for um, humans? Aristotle's going to identify it as politics. Okay, so the science of the human good is politics. If then there is some end of the things we do which we desire for its own sake, everything else being desired for the sake of this, and if we do not choose everything for the sake of something else, for at that rate the process would go on to infinity so that our desires would be empty and vain, clearly this must be the good and the chief good. So what is the chief good? It's that which we desire for its own sake. So we're not doing this action, whatever it is, for the sake of anything else, we're doing it for its own sake. Okay. Um, uh, will not the knowledge of it then have a great influence on life? Shall we not, like archers who have a mark to aim at, be more likely to hit upon what is right? So here Aristotle's arguing via analogy. He's saying that we could be, you know, think of an archer. Okay, won't an archer do better when it knows what it's a, when the archer knows um, what they are aiming at, where when they know where the target is. In this way, if we want to determine how to be good people, well, we need to know what we should be aiming at. We need to know where the target is. Okay. If so, we must try in outline at least to determine what it is and of which of the sciences or capacities it is the object. It would seem to belong to the most authoritative art and that which is most truly the master art. Okay. So, um, uh, this master art, what is the one thing which everything else aims at? Well, Ar Aristotle isn't the type to leave you wanting. He answers that immediately. And politics um, appears to be of this nature, for it is this that ordains which of the sciences should be studied in a state, and which each class of citizens should learn, and up to what point they should learn them. And we see even the most highly esteemed of capacities to fall under this. For example, strategy, economics, rhetoric, which is public speaking, um, now, since politics uses the rest of the sciences, and since again it legislates as to what we are to do and what we are to abstain from, the end of this science must include uh, those of the others, so that this end must be the human good. Okay, so quite a lengthy section there from Aristotle, but a very important one. Even when we think of really, really, really important um, aspects like economics and strategy or you know mil he's talking about military strategy here so defense and attack um, rhetoric being able to present yourself um, remember Greece direct democracy so being able to present yourself to the government or the, the parliament um, this all of this is actually subordinate to that chief science these are all just parts of the chief science which is politics Okay, the end of this, since that is the act that we are performing, which everything else is working towards, then the end of that act must be the chief good for mankind. Okay, um, for even if the end is the same for a single man and for a state, that of the state seems at all events something greater and more complete, whether to obtain or to preserve. Um, though it is worthwhile to attain the end merely for one man, it is finer and more godlike to attain it for a nation or for city-states. So here what Aristotle is saying is, if you live in a really terrible society, then you should still be trying to achieve the, the, the highest good that you possibly can, but you won't achieve the chief good. Um, not to say you shouldn't work towards it, you should try and create political change, but it's unlikely simply because of the society you live in. Um, it would be a life well spent trying to make yourself a better person, but if you're not also making your society better, then you're not actually achieving the chief good. It's not to say your life's been wasted, but it still had other things that it could have done. Okay, um, So to achieve the good for one person is 
good, uh, as Aristotle puts it, to achieve it for an entire society. This is godlike. Uh, these, then, are the ends at which our inquiry aims, since it is political science in one sense of that term. Okay. Um, book one, part three. Uh, Aristotle here just sort of putting boundaries on what we can ask from this subject. Uh, we must not expect more precision than the subject matter admits of. The student should have reached years of um, discretion. So what Aristotle is going to say here is that whilst it would be great to have a perfect understanding of what the good is, it doesn't really allow for that. It's um, much more imprecise than that. Uh, and so we have to be satisfied with somewhat ambiguous answers. Um, and who should we be asking these questions to? Those people who are experts in it. And in this way, the young of character shouldn't be asked about these things because they haven't sort of lived enough to be able to identify the difference between a good and a bad life. Um, we must not expect more precision than the subject matter admits of. The student should have reached years of discretion. Our discussion will be adequate if it has as much clearness as the subject matter admits of, for precision is not to be sought for alike in all discussions, any more than in all the products of the crafts. Now noble and just actions which political science investigates exhibit much variety and fluctuation, so that they may be thought to exist only by convention and not by nature. Um, so I've sort of ripped through that um, opening section. Uh, Basically, we're talking about something that's really hard to define, okay? Um, but goods exhibit a similar fluctuation because they bring harm to many people. For before now, men have been undone by reason of their wealth and others by reason of their courage. We must be content then in speaking of such subjects and with such premises to indicate the truth roughly and in outline and in speaking about things which are only for the most part true and the premises of the same kind to reach conclusions that are no better. So what we're saying here is we can't make absolute statements when we're talking about this like the good is being wealthy. Well, I'm sure that we can all think of people who seem to have been undone by their wealth, you know. Um, Kanye West doesn't seem to be prospering because he's wealthy. Uh, Lindsay Lohan certainly hasn't prospered because she's wealthy. If anything, it seems like the wealth that these people have acquired has actually been part of their undoing. This is what's sending them around the bend. Um, uh, we can all think of people who are so courageous that they're silly, you know, maybe an outdated um, example now, but someone like um, Nick Rewalt is a good one that comes to mind. He was so courageous on the field, um, which for those of you who aren't footy fans, he would do some extraordinary, extraordinary things. Um, but he put himself in so much danger when he was doing them. Like, he could have quite easily died several times playing football because of the way that he played. Now, we look at that and we say that that's courageous, but it's like, it seems too much. It would be wrong to look at him and say, that's the way that you should play football. Maybe he is being too courageous in the way that he plays. Okay. Um, so, we need to be very careful trying to make absolute statements about this. Do we need wealth to lead a good life? Yep but the right amount. Do we need courage? Yep, but the right amount. And I can't tell you what that amount is. I have to be a bit ambiguous. Um, okay, so continuing on. In the same spirit, therefore, should each type of statement be received, for it is the mark of an educated man to look for precision in each class of things just so far as the nature of the subject admits. It is evidently equally foolish to accept a probable uh, accept probable reasoning from a mathematician and to determine, uh, sorry, and to demand from a rhetorician demonstrative proofs. So in other words, in the same way that we shouldn't ask for ambiguous answers in maths, we shouldn't be asking for definitive answers in maybe a field like philosophy. Okay. Um, if this sounds a little bit wishy-washy, think of health, which Aristotle is going to talk about later in the reading as a good example. Um, I can't really tell you what health is. There's no definitive um, guide to what health is. Like I could say, well, it's eating right and exercising right. But what does that mean? It's going to be different for each person. But we all have a very clear concept of what health is. Um, so 
don't ask me for a perfect definition of what health is. It doesn't exist. It's going to be different for each person. That's not to say that it doesn't like that health, the concept doesn't exist. We all know that it exists. We all know the difference between someone who is healthy and someone who is unhealthy. But to say that we could ever put this down perfectly on paper is, is probably misguided. It's not like maths. I can put an equation down perfectly on paper. I can't put a concept like health down perfectly on paper. Maybe this is true of the good as well. Um, now, each man judges well the things he knows, and of these he is a good judge. And so the man who has been educated in a subject is a good judge of that subject, and the man who has received an all-round education is a good judge in general. Hence, a young man is not a proper hearer of lectures on political science, for he is inexperienced in the actions that occur in life. Okay, so um, basically, we're really good at the things that we are experts in, and if you want to know something about um, I don't know, philosophy. I'd like to think I'm something of an expert in it at least. Um, I'm a good person to talk to. You want to know something about um, fixing your car? Don't talk to me. Don't know the first thing about it, okay? Uh, and so, um, you know, when you're asking questions, not everyone's opinion is equally valid. You should be asking experts what they think. Okay, Who is the expert for our chief good, which is political science? Well, not young people. Aristotle is saying. Um, now, before you get too offended, he's going to clarify this as young of character. Um, but young people just haven't lived enough to know what good political science is. Okay. Um, so, continuing on, for he's inexperienced in his actions, uh, in the actions that occur in life, but its discussions start from these and are about these. And further, since he tends to follow his passions, his studies will be vain and unprofitable, because the end aimed at is not knowledge, but action. Uh, and it makes no difference whether he is young in years or youthful in character. The defect does not depend on time, but on his living and pursuing each successive object as passion directs. Uh, for to such persons as to the incontinent, knowledge brings no profit. Uh, but to those who desire and act in accordance with reason, knowledge about such matters will be of great benefit. So don't ask a fool for advice, essentially. So what, what Aristotle's talking about is being young, youthful in character. You can be a young person, but have a, um, a developed character. Like you can have experienced things in this world. Um, you can know the realities of life, the good and the bad, and be young. But chances are, if you're young, you probably haven't experienced the full spectrum of things. This is not to say that simply getting older will allow you to do this. Okay, some of us, you know, some people stay childish in their old age. They never really learn anything. They never gain an understanding of how they should be living their life. Um, and so these types of adults, they're young in character. They're not to be taken as our prime example either, okay? Um, these remarks about the student, the sort of treatment to be expected, and the purpose of the inquiry may be taken as our preface. So what have we learned from this? Firstly, don't ask for more precision than the subject matter allows because you're wasting your time. I can't give you a perfect definition of something like health. Uh, I can also not give you a perfect definition of something like the good. Uh, who should you ask about these things to gain a better understanding of them? People who are experts in them. You should avoid people who are young, particularly young of character, um, because they probably just haven't lived long enough and seen enough of life to be able to give you any sort of um, uh, insight into these things. Okay. Hopefully you enjoyed the first section. Many more to go with Aristotle. Um, so I'll see you next time. Like and subscribe. Bye.